Good morning. Um, Professor Rome did steal a little bit of my, my talk there at the beginning, um, but I'm sure I can forgive him for that. Um, although today's discussion will be on the monastery itself, its lands, its rights, its churches, how those were built up, um, just to follow on from the very courteous introduction that I received, um, the, the monastic artilleries themselves are, are really only a very, very small part of the evidence that we have for for Schoon Abbey and the the cartilages themselves, both located um, in Edinburgh, the National Archives, um, they account for roughly 200 documents, charters um, that exist for the monastery. Um, the first one was constructed um, around about the 1350s, and the second one around about the 1450s. Schoon itself. Um, the final erection as a temple of lordship is in 1606, so there is a very large gap there. Um, and the material itself, the extraneous material, um, it probably roughly numbers about 800 um, items, and that includes very large few charters, but also includes very small entries in the exchequer rolls, um, the accounts of the Lord High Treasurer and so on. All of that information put together provides you roughly with you know about a thousand items in which to focus and on for Schoon itself. So to the portfolio of land rights and churches. So King Alexander's decision to found an Augustinian monastery at Schoon, circa eleven fifteen, with canons from Nostal Priory in Yorkshire. It was something that obviously was happening all over Europe. Magnates, kings, prelates, founding these monasteries, displaying their personal piety, and also intent on in reforming the religious life um, of their kingdoms. His foundation at Schoon was his only monastic foundation, and it's part of Alexander's wider attempt to reform the religious life of Scotland, a strategy that he started years earlier in 1107 when he made Turgill head of Durham Priory as to Bishop of St Andrews. Now, as we've already seen this morning from Oliver's paper and Richard Fawcett's, there is a discrepancy about the date of foundation of Schoon. Some say 1115, some say 1120, and these are primarily based on when Nostal Priory in Yorkshire was converted to the Augustinian rule. Um, there is a 13th century entry to the Chronicle of Melrose that dates the foundation of Schoon at 1115, this again is further supported by Walter Burrell's 15th century Scotty Chronicon. Um, the date itself has been extended to 1120, and for me, it's really a bit of a red herring. It's a misnomer. It's five years. It's not exactly a large parameter over which we're dealing, and the lower and upper limits of those dates don't span any particular reign. So I think the, the amount of time that seems to have been spent discussing was at 11.15 or 11.20 um, by very, very um, important historians over the, the last 50 years um, seems to have been rather quite a waste. What we do know is that by 11.15 there were already a substantial Augustinian presence in the British Isles, primarily driven by King Alexander I's brother-in-law and his sister King Henry I of England and his wife Queen Matilda who by 1115 had already founded over 20 Augustinian monasteries in England and Wales. Indeed, the reign of King Henry I, 1100-1135, has been called the heyday of Augustinian foundations by Janet Burton. Um, this familial connection with religious foundations, with the reform of the religious life, with personal piety, is something that is much closer to home for King Alexander I. His mother and father, King Malcolm III and Queen Margaret, had settled Benedictine monks from Canterbury at Dunfermline, circa 1080. In addition to that, his younger brother David, later King David I, had settled Tyrannensian monks from Tyrone at Selkirk, circa 1113. And this foundation was not only the first in Scotland, but it was the first in the entire British Isles of the Tyrannensian order. And it's against this wider framework, this backdrop, which Alexander's foundation at Schoon um, must be viewed. Now, as an order, the Augustinians would grow rapidly in Scotland, um, approximately 20 communities, 
um, of cannons and cannon S's, the exact number is very difficult to determine because for some of the purported cells and priories there is a real lack of evidence. But a number that made Augustinians the second most numerous order in Scotland after the Cistercians, and all of this began with King Alexander the First Foundation. As a monastery, it had a presence for almost 500 years until Schoon's erection as a temporal lordship for David Murray, Lord Schoon, in 1606. And in that time, it built up a portfolio of lands, rites and churches that stretched from Tweeddale, Lothian, northward through Edinburgh, into Fife, out to St Andrews, over the Tay to Gowrie, northwards to Inverness, and finally up to Sutherland. This was done, as you would expect, through the patronage of royals, magnates, burgesses, landholders, but it's also done, equally importantly, through the design and the acumen of the canons and the obedientries and the abbots themselves. They were a driving force behind that. Now, the choice of Schoon as a site at which they found the monastery, with the benefit of hindsight, seems a logical choice. It was one of the four royal manors of Gowrie, along with Lomforgan, Cooper and Strathardo. As we've seen already, it was a centuries-old assembly site, the royal inauguration site. It was north of the Tay, in the heartland of the kingdom, and it was in King Malcolm IV's own words, in Principali Sede Regnae Nostri, the principal seat of our kingdom. Now, back to the antiquarians and their documentation, they have said and purported that the, there was a Chaldee community there, a, a community of Celtic monks at Schoon, and there really is no evidence of this, and it's something that seems to have been repeated and recited um, through the 20th century, but there really is no evidence of it. And pre-Augustinian Schoon, um, as a religious site, if at all, is something that we don't really have much evidence for. Um, and where there has been examples of Chaldee communities, particularly at St Andrews, when there seems to have been some sort of conversion to the Augustinian rule, it's either went smoothly, um, which wasn't the case at St Andrews, or there have been issues. Um, and I would have expected that for something like Schoon, if that had been the case, that we would find some of that evidence, but there is none. So King Alexander the First Foundation Charter, it's a 15th century transcription. It is the only one, essentially, that survives, although this is recited in various confirmation charters of um, kings of Scotland. It lists the initial grants as Liff, Lintrose, Canopter, Fingas, Klein, Gerdy, Bindocky, and Innerbust. Um, the map's actually turned out a little bit better than I thought, which is good. I hope everybody can, can see that. Um, in addition to this, what we also see are Tofts down in Edinburgh, at Stirling, a Toft in Perth, at Inverkeithing, and up in Aberdeen as, as well. In addition to this, they also granted extensive fishing rights in the Tay, something that the canons would really focus in on um, in the next 500 years. And teen income, primarily from the king's kitchen, and came from a ship that's supposed to come up the Tay to Schoon, and Oliver already touched on very much how that Schoon was almost the, the limit at which a ship could berth. Whether or not ships actually managed to come up to Schoon, don't really know if that is feasible, if it actually happened, but certainly they had the right, um, they had the right to do that. By the time of King Alexander the First's death in 1124, he'd also granted the canons their own court, the right not to answer in any other courts, and also an island in Loch Tay where the canons were to erect a church under a monastic rule, and this is roughly Loch Tay um, in here. Um, please forgive my poor cartographic skills um, for that. So the total size of these holdings, if we to believe this 15th century um, transcription of the Foundation Charter puts it at roughly three and a half thousand acres. I think everyone would agree that's a very substantial holding. Um, but unfortunately, due to the documentary, the lack of documentary evidence for Dunfermline at that time and for Selkirk, um, primarily because Selkirk was moved to Kelso in 1128, um, it's really not possible to compare Schoon's early holdings against the Benedictine Abbey of um, Dunfermline or the, the Tyrone Saint settlement at Tyrone 
which is unfortunate because I think at that time out they're really giving us a very good comparative um, for that. Now, to compare schools with these other Augustinian monasteries in Scotland is not possible because at this time the 1124 Schoon is the only Augustinian monastery in the country. We could look to England for that, um, and I would always urge caution if we do. Um, we do look at that. Um, one of the best studies um, of an Augustinian settlement is Ian Kershaw's study of Bolton Priory. Um, and one of the conclusions that Ian Kershaw comes to is that many of the possessions for that priory certainly had a very um, a primarily rentier interest. Um, and Schoon's early income from payment in the former was in the form of rents in kind. Um, and it's during the reign of King David I, 1124 to 1153, it was fixed with Schoon, and they were to receive from every ploughgate on the Feast of All Saints, one cow, two pigs, four bags of meal, ten thieves of oats, ten hens, two hundred eggs, ten handful of candles, four pennies of soap, and twenty and a half meal of cheese. Now, if the canons of Schoon in this early period are directly exploiting any demean then it's potentially coming, and this again is only a theory, is coming uh, in Arbust, which is um, just slightly up the road from, from Schoon here. Um, and that is because of one conspicuous absence from King Alexander the First Foundation Charter. It doesn't grant the canons Schoon itself. There is no mention of the canons being awarded Schoon. It's a very unorthodox, um, in my experience so far, very unorthodox approach. You'd expect when a monastery is founded, they usually get a town or a very big, vast tract of land. That doesn't seem to be the case at Schoon. As you can see from here, there is the site of the monastery itself, and then there's this very early indication of lands um, achieving uh, along the Gowrie into the hinterland. Um, now, this presents uh, a bit of a problem when thinking about what did pre-Augustinian Schoon look like. Was there a church settlement there at all? Um, if there was, then there's no documentary evidence of it. If it was, then it must have been very small. Certainly didn't have any sort of extensive land holding. Because over the next 200 years, as we'll see as we kind of pop through the maps, you begin to see that Schoon, the canons, through the patronage that they received, but also through their own drive, they slowly but surely acquire Schoon. Plowgate by plowgate, team by team, they get Schoon. So in general, the 12th century saw an expansion and consolidation of Schoon's portfolio. Um, the strategy of expansion and consolidation is one that is employed throughout the history of the monastery. So their teamed income from the four royal manors of Gowrie was increased by King David I. He also granted them teamed income from the from his mill in the River Amund. Um, so we start to see around here um, the cannon start to push out westward to the other side of, of the Tay. And I think it would be, um, I don't think we should see the Tay as a barrier um, to to the canons being granted land on the other side. King William I granted his entire team from the parish of Schoon to the canons. So here we have, um, later on in the 12th century, the, the, consolid the beginning of a consolidation process at Schoon, where they start to gain more of the teamed income. Um, this is complemented when William gives, King William I grants them a toff and 20 acres of arable land in Schoon. Um, the canons receive Inver Almond and Inver Gowrie, and you start to see along here at Inver Gowrie. Um, from the Kings of Scotland, the two Sheeswards into St Andrews, um, down here, Bishops uh, Hugh and Richard grant them land in St Andrews, and this pushes obviously into one of the main ecclesiastical centres of Scotland. There's an Augustinian monastery there, it's the, the seat of the Bishop of St Andrews, and they hold on to this land. Um, the can as well into the 15th and 16th century. The canons received land in Tibbermore. Again, we're starting to see Tibbermore out into the west, um, the western side of the Tay. Um, they also pushed northwards with the Earl, of, the Earl of Athol, major donor in this century, granting the phanages of Dunmarnock and Finbiwi, um to to the monastery, as well as the Church of Logie 8, 
with its dependent chapels of Kelly Changey, Dunfoldy, Kelly Chasey, and Kilmichael Tullimet, which I've marked here as D. So we're looking round about this section here. So the documentary record for the 12th century begins to produce a picture of the ecclesiastical holdings of Schoon Abbey, an Episcopal confirmation charter of the Bishop of St Andrews in the mid-12th century confirms the following churches to Schoon. The Church of Schoon with its chapel of Confons, Crag and Rate, the churches of Liff, Invergowrie, which was granted by King Malcolm IV, Logie Dundee, granted by Richard, Bishop of St Andrews, and also the churches of Cambus Michael, Bordwick and Carrington, the last two have been granted by King David I. So here we see the canons pushing further, deeper into Lothian, extending their holdings. Um, and at this stage, it's not clear if the canons, if these, if these churches, um, parish churches, have been fully appropriated to the monastery just yet. Um, the confirmation charter in the mid 12th century certainly doesn't indicate that, but there is a confirmation charter from the early 15th century, uh, 13th century, sorry. Um, that that does begin that does list these these churches as being granted in proprious uses, the indication that they would have been fully appropriated to the monastery. In the 13th century, um, in addition to these, the canons also obtained license from King Malcolm IV to have a smith, a tanner, and a shoemaker at the monastery. And by the turn of the 13th century, King William had granted them the right to elect one of their own as abbot with the king's assent and council. So really what we see here by the, the 1300s um, is a push, a great expansion in this area um, that will be greatly extended during the 14th century. And it is a monastery that is evolving economically, ecclesiastically from that. And within the 13th century, the royal patronage comes from King Alexander II, where he grants his lordships of Rate and Confons, also grants the woods of Campsey, and he grants two further acres in Schoon. Again, this example of consolidation, the, the canons are really getting to grips and building up their lordship of Schoon itself. Um, the canons receive further lands in Gowrie, they receive also from Geoffrey, Clerk of Deliverance, they get lands in Clickmanon, they get lands in Dunkeld, so again they're pushing northwards, and all the way up to Inverness here, all coming very early on in that century. Um, and it was in the 13th century where the canons significantly increased their holdings in, in Perth. As we've seen from very early on from the Foundation Charter, they have a presence in the borough, um, but in this century there are several grants all documented in the cartularies um, that point towards an expansion within uh, the borough, um, Toffs, Crofts, land, booths, um, and it's something that, in my opinion, the Burgesses clearly wanted. Yes, it's an act of piety, but I think the canons are also bringing great economic benefit um, to that town, um, as it's one of the most important trading centres in the country, um, it's obviously hugely important for the monastery um, and it allows the canons or the abbot anytime there's a parliament in Perth, he has property there, he can stay and he doesn't have to make the journey over the Tay back across up to Schoon. Um, in Perth itself, um, obviously allowed the canons to sell any surplus that they didn't need, buy anything that they needed um, and I think it's one of the main reasons that Schoon itself flourished, given its close proximity to Perth. And Perth itself was also a very steady um, source of income from the borough firms, although that income is very small, it's roughly just over five pounds, but it's something that's paid almost annually um, from the 13th century to the turn into the 17th century. So it's in this century that the ecclesiastical footprint of Schoon again expands. We're seeing Churches of Red Gordon, um, that's donated by Malcolm, Earl of Fife. Um, we're seeing the, pari uh, the Church of Echt up in Mar, so well up into Aberdeenshire. And probably most interestingly and strangely enough, up here in Sutherland, the Church of Kildonan. Now there is no record of this church ever being granted to Schoon, 
Um, when it does appear in the documentary record, it appears in a confirmation charter um, of Pope Honorius III in the early 13th century. Um, and, you know, you're talking maybe, what, 200 miles away from the monastery? Um, and there are examples in this time of monasteries exchanging lands or rights or income with other monasteries, other um, other laymen because the holdings that they have are too far away. But this doesn't happen with Schoon. Kildonan stays in the possession of Schoon until the Reformation. So we're looking at easily 250 years Schoon has Kildonan in its, um, in its possession. And one of the reasons behind that, maybe the main reason, is that Kildonan is a pre-bend of Dornoch Cathedral, which obviously gives the abbot influence, which I think is one of the primary drivers for him keeping something that is so far away from the monastery. I think that Kildonan is a really good example of the canons and the abbot demonstrating real economic acumen, you know, a business mindset. This gives us money, this gives us influence, let's not get rid of it. And their drive to do that, their drive to consolidate as much through patronage is coming from them, them themselves. And there are examples in the record in this period. Um, so we've got the canons of Schoon, the monks of Cuparangas, and King Alexander II coming to an agreement, um, which by the teen rights um, for the king's kitchen are swapped for Blair Gowrie. And also within that, the, the monks of Cuparangas give up their right to the moor of Blair Gowrie. And given the, the difficulty that seems to have existed in gathering teen in general, but certainly from something like the King's Kitchen, something like this trade certainly demonstrates um, a substantial benefit for Schoon. Donations to the monastery in the second part of the 13th century um, have either went undocumented or they simply just weren't happening. It's not until the reign of King Robert I um, that royal patronage is resumed when in 1312 he grants to the monastery the thainage of Schoon. This is essentially the culmination of 200 years' effort. And I know the map doesn't really, sh really show that well, but for the last 200 years, teamed income has been consolidated, arable land, tofts, and then eventually with the thainage of Schoon. It is a glaring success. It really gives them control in their immediate vicinity. From the documentary record of this period, certainly in the, the early 14th century, um, under um, the reign of Robert I and David II, the charters themselves, what we start to see is how some of the canons, have, how they, they've developed some of their land. So particularly looking at things such as um, Kincarathy, which is granted um, by the Bishop of St Andrews in the 13th century, um, we find out that the canons have a quarry there because Robert I is asking for license to take stone from that for the Church of Perth, for the Bridge of Perth and the, Church, um, and the Bridge of Erm. Um, and probably the most illuminating thing for me, and especially to connect it to this conference, is one of the grants that Robert I, um, one of the gifts he gives to Schoon, and that is he gives exclusive fishing rights in the Lock of Blair on account of his need when he's at the monastery. That is the terminology that the Charter uses. And I think it highlights the relationship between what we've got as the Augustinian, the, the ecclesiastical monastery, and Schoon, the inauguration site, the one of Parliament of Colloquiums. Obviously there was a need previous to this for um, a peripatetic kingship, that would stop at Schoon to be able to be fed, to be clothed, to be housed in that. But it seems to be in this period that we start to see a direct evidence of Robert I wanting, granting something specifically for his own need um, in that time. And as we know, Schoon was a focal point. It was one of the main sites along with Perth used until the 15th century, roughly 34 times for assemblies, colloquies, parliaments. That doesn't include inaugurations, or, you know, the king just happens to be travelling about the country and stops on by. But one of the things that is really evident from uh, the documentary source is that when the king is at Schoon, there's a lot of reconfirmations for Schoon. Now, obviously, this could just simply be 
the king's parliamentary business. But for me, I would argue that the king's there. He's maybe there on some sort of secular um, activity, and the canons of Scotland just so happen to rock up and say, whilst you're here, could you reconfirm this for us or give us something like that? Maybe not as crude as um, as that, but certainly something could be along those lines. By the mid-14th century, this is really the zenith of Schoon's portfolio. Um, this is the true extent of what they once held, stretching from the church of St Cuthbert down here in Tweeddale all the way up. I mean, it really starts to stretch the entire length of the country. So as you can see here, you know, the main map we're looking in here, there's a substantial holding in Gowrie to the east of the monastery. It is where they are primarily focused. But Scoon doesn't have a monopoly on Gowrie. Just up the road, there's Cooper Angus, the Cistercian Monastery, and in Gowrie is the southernmost element of, of their holdings. And there are several disputes between the canons of Scoon and the monks of Cooper Angus in this area. Particularly interesting for me as well um, is very little push westward um, across the Tay. Yes, there's some, but there's not a lot. And one of the driving factors behind that is in Shaffrey Abbey, is round about here potentially, and if my accurate skills are there. Um, I think this is blocking Schoon moving westward. Um, they have extensive holdings in in that area. The late 14th and 15th century, it's a great financial challenge in time for Schoon. Um, intermittent warfare with England, plague, many of the charters between 1330 and 1450 are about instructing the sheriffs to give relief from debts. Um, it's instructing baileys to ensure that teams are collected, that payments are made. And this extends well into the 15th century, where there's cases in front of the Lord's Auditors about teen payment of wheat that isn't of suitable quality. And it's from the mid-15th century that the documentary record becomes more varied, and in particular, rental records begin to show where and to whom Schoon was renting property. For example, in 1489, 21 families were renting 60 acres of land called the Acres of Klein for £12, 7 shilling, 6 pence, 39 poultry, 159 days of work at the Abbey, and 49 carriages. Lands leased in the 1470s and 80s went to John Wright, as an example, who styled our carpenter, and also, those, also lands to those in charge of the Abbey's flock. Now, these are very much just illustrative examples of the types of things, the type of evidence that the, the documentary sources and the rentals are, are throwing up. But you start to build a picture of Scrooge favouring um, the people that are giving something back to the monastery, skilled people, trusted individuals. It's in the second half of the 15th century when the feuding of Scrooge's lands began. This may have been triggered by a 1458 Act of Parliament urging laymen and churchmen to follow the King's example and set land at few. There are a few isolated charters um, in the century, uh, in the century, and very early in the 16th century. However, it's when pa Patrick Hepburn becomes commendator of Schoon Abbey in 1535 that the feeling of the land picks up pace and is greatly intensified after the Reformation. Between 1535 and 1560, many of the lands that were feuded went to Patrick's family, with the mother of four of his 12 sons receiving land along with his brothers. And his actions caused the canons of Schoon in 1545 to request Patrick to sign an agreement promising he would not force them to consent to fruin of lands except by their own free will. After the monastery was sacked by a mob from Dundee in 1559 and the Reformation Parliament in 1560, Patrick intensifies the fruin of the Abbey lands. There are well over 50 charters um, documenting the extensive fruin that Patrick undertakes as commendator. These continue after Patrick's death in 1571, and they slowly taper off at the end of the at the end of of the century. Um, one of the main reasons behind that is Patrick seems to be using the destruction of the monastery um, as a supposed, let's say, fig leaf, um, to cover the naked greed that he seems to have, because the grassums that these individuals are paying, the initial payment to go into the few. Um, means that within a five-year period, 
Patrick's able to collect over £4,000. Um, how much of this actually went towards repairing the monastery? But he seems to have even agreed in this, um, the chapter Richard Fawcett was talking about earlier. Um, is very unclear because, as we know, the monastery itself, um, there are no standing remains. The lands that were primarily feud are in Gowrie, breaking down into kind of southern Persia here. Some of the most the ones that we've got here, Rate, Confons, um, and nothing seems to be sacred. They don't seem to be holding anything back. It's lands, it's mills, it's fishing rights. It is the very things that have made the abbey successful. So in 1581, there was a change of Lord Superior for the tenants of Schoon when the lands of the monastery were created in the earldom of Gowrie for the king's cousin, William Riven. It was a short-lived endowment. Um, three years later, William was executed for treason and the lands of the monastery returned to the crown. There are some examples of feuding under, um, under the king. Um, but in 1606, James VI directs Schoon as a temporal lordship for David Murray, Lord Schoon, and it brought the end to almost 500 years of history for a monastery that was at the centre of Scottish life for so long, and the lands passed into full secular ownership, bringing to a close one, um, a story about one of the most important and interesting religious settlements in Scotland. Thank you. <laughs>